pretty good. I mean, that's at least a third of the audience. Uh, so many, many years of development, um, an entirely new software platform, really, really ambitious stuff. Um, and Sven's uh, spent all his blood, sweat, and tears for the past uh, few years since he joined DDM, making sure it's the right shaped thing for what we're trying to do. Let's talk about that right shape. Um, so here's a diagram. It kind of, kind of talks about sort of uh, the AI enter and workflow, but it's not really particular to that. You'll see this sort of shape across almost every kind of workflows you see. But let's have a look at the sort of big sort of burgeoning trends we see. Uh, number one is data is very high volume and highly distributed. Number two, we're adding much, much more structured data, database style data, metadata to our unstructured data. And the basic example of that is think of a video file which has been recorded with AI assistance. It gets labeled in every frame with the objects in that frame. So tens of thousands of tags associated with one file. Structured data, unstructured data. Obviously, data privacy and security goes without saying. Um, and then that goes along with sharing. We've heard from our cloud partners here today. Um, and that secure sharing and the quality of service associated with multiple tenants is now key, not only to cloud providers, but also to Fortune 1000 companies, to uh, academic organizations doing chargeback to the different, uh, different groups. We all want quality of service and multi-tenancy. Then finally, high efficiency. We want not to waste our resources. Just what we've been talking about with Exascaler, with this new thing, which is provide an AI data fabric, we want that same level of efficiency. Now, what do we have as an option out there? If we go out to the market today, what do we see? And I look at this very carefully, of course, and I read all the manuals of our competitive storage systems, and I uh, read exactly what they mean when they say quality of service, exactly what they mean when they say uptime and, and stuff like this. And even the best of the best out there, the simplest, the most enterprisey, um, they fail on about half of these points on this slide. So either they are still hardware defined, or they're not really cloud compatible, or both or they get Achilles' heel when it comes to rights, we've seen that many times today, or they're too complex, needing back-end switches, back-end cables, all these things. You look at the best of the best out there, and you'll find they fail on these really key points. And to succeed on these really key points, you have to do something very, very special, which is what we've done with the Infinia. You need to start with a blank sheet of paper and make sure you're paying attention to these things when you're writing the very core native data structures of the file system. And that takes time, and we've taken time, and uh, we're launching that today. Sven. Yeah, so if you, you know, we've talked about these entire workflows uh, many, many times, um, but it all really starts depending on, you know, which different workflow you look at usually at the ingest part. And, and James just mentioned uh, some of it, you know, data comes in, Data gets labeled either manually or automated. There's some cleanup, there's some training, inference, optimization at the end of it. And so obviously customers would like to have different ways to interacting with the data. So it's no longer about just a file system. It's no longer just about object store. It's really about the combination of all these different things together. And so what we've done with the internal data structures of the product is really to build an architecture, which by the way, at the very low bottom of all of it uh, is based on a highly distributed key value store. And it essentially implements views to this data uh, with different protocols that end users then you know, perceive as files, uh, objects, or individual database tables it, itself. And so the key point of this obviously was we want to have massive acceleration in all these different data points. Uh, we want to have massive scalability. And scalability is not necessarily what people you know, traditionally thought about like performance and capacity. It's also about how do you actually get data from the edge, collect data there, tag things, filter it down, figure out what you actually really need, efficiently transfer it over to a data center to further processing there, and then you know enhance, enrich, run trainings with it, and eventually deploy it potentially back uh, into the edge. So I'm not saying that this is what we do in version one, but that's kind of the visionary statement that we're trying to achieve with the product, and you will see how we will basically get, uh, get along with that. So it's all about 
edge to core to cloud, being able to integrate in modern workflows, being able to handle massive amount of metadata in the system, much, much more than you know, you've ever seen in, in traditional systems before, while also obviously keeping in mind you know, sustainability, reduced power, doing all these efficiency things that DDN is, is known for for a long time. Yeah, when you talk to us in detail about this stuff, we'll explain you know, what we've really done in the core of the, the storage system, the file system, the object store, uh, the data fabric, to enable these features. And it's very different from what you see in existing storage systems today. If you really think about how to do data movement, how to do metadata tagging, unlimited metadata queries, uh, how to scale like we do, you've got to do some very different things at the core, which you'll find lacking in other storage systems today. Here's one of those things, um, and I'll let Sven talk about this in a minute, but we've, we've been, you know, at the core, of course, it's performance. We're pretty good at performance, and it's not something we've been worried about because we can't help ourselves but be performant, right? Um, but one of the things we've done is build a hybrid I.O. engine because being ambitious, we want to cope not only with traditional AI and HPC workloads, but also the opposite end of the spectrum, what, how can we serve a, a low latency write from a database? That database style I.O., how can we do both at the same time efficiently with one set of media, effectively one platform? And the way you do it is by treating the data differently depending on how it comes in. So completely differently, different data structures, different data path. So we can give low latency to those things that are expecting low latency, and then high bandwidth to those other things expecting high bandwidth. We actually, um, I think we're announcing tomorrow um, some of the work we've done in conjunction with Sandia, which you might want to talk about. Yeah, and so, you know, to, to put a little bit more color on this, as, uh, as James said, I mean, the key is really to handle very opposite ends of the spectrum of performance and workload expectations. And so the key thing is we implemented all of these without any knobs on them. You know, traditionally, there's lots of other vendors who build storage products that say, oh, I can tune this towards this, or I can tune this towards that. Uh, in Infinia, it's really you set up the system and then the system makes these decisions automatically for you based on the actual work that you throw at it. So depending on how you write or how you read from it, it dynamically adjusts how it stores the data, how it lays out the data, and also how it reads back the data in case you get that back. And so the key thing is here is it's not just acceleration for all kind of workloads, it's acceleration for all kind of workloads without actually the end user need to be involved and be an expert in actually training it. And that's kind of an Another key thing. Multi-tenancy, we're going to be talking about that a lot. So we've heard it for many years, right? Everybody wants it, and actually if you look out in the market there and you really analyze what other storage vendors mean today with multi-tenancy, it's not the thing you want. People actually advertise caps, uh, throttling, uh, they lose efficiency, it's awkward to do. We've gone, again, at the drawing board stage, thought about this very carefully. How do we build a multi-tenanted environment, which is the sort of shape that people really want? Dynamic, super easy, looks after itself, very scalable, not only tenants, but subtenants, right? All of this stuff, and it's built right into the core of our system. We just put this little screenshot up of the GUI, this API, CLIs. We can see here, we just bring up a tenant, we create a new tenant, we give them an IO priority, we give them a capacity allocation, and we close the GUI and we're off. And if you want to change that on a Friday and say, okay, Bob, uh, your allocation goes up by 50%. You get more performance of the shared system on Friday for 12 hours. That's instantaneous. So real-time changes take effect immediately, complete fair share, hands-free. Administrators do very little, API controlled, automate all this quality of service. So I'd say great for cloud service providers but also great for anybody with a shared resource who wants to make sure that everybody, nobody gets pushed out by neighbors. And the key thing to all of this is really designing it in from the very beginning, uh, because if you look at traditional systems, as James said, you know they all have some form of quality of service or isolation, but it usually is, okay, I can give you a LAN, and then you own this LAN, and you own whatever performance and capacity is associated uh, with it. And so in Infinia, we really completely decouple these things. So an individual I.O. that comes in uses always all resources in the system. It doesn't matter 
matter what server or drive is in it, it uses all of it and it just dynamically adjusts where things get stored and how much pr uh, priority individual requests get. And that allows you, if you're a single person using the system, you can use all of its resources. And if you want to decide Friday night, you know, whatever the finance department has a super credible, important run to do, you crank up the performance, they get 100% of it, and then, you know, Saturday morning it's all done, you crank it down to 10% and the rest of the users get their fair share, but there is no physical movement of resources or assignment or tagging to network adapters. It's all basically built into the quality of service layer of the stack itself. Yeah, that's an important one. So we've built the concept of multi-tenancy, quality of service at Treasure, into the key space, into the core piece of software that's holding the data. If you look at other storage vendors, you see they basically apportion a server container, or they apportion a special logical LUN, or they apportion a piece of the network. They basically divide up the system and make it very static and non-dynamic. We've done it in the key space, which is why it's dynamic, which is why it's easy, which is why it's hands-free. So fair share algorithm, People here probably know that from their scheduling system. You know, you can basically put a bunch of tokens in on the heads of your various tenants, and then the system will basically check incoming traffic and then apply, uh, allocate resources to according to the policy that you prescribed. So really revolutionary, and we think this is gonna be very popular. Um, tenants and subtenants, dynamic, tailored clouds, share hardware resources securely. Every tenant is automatically encrypted uh, very securely um, and can be segregated uh, purely logically. Uh, set and forget, fully automated QoS. So how are we deploying this thing? Um, so Mark Hamilton mentioned this before. We can run this and have run it on pretty much anything you can think of. So in the cloud, uh, on AMD, on Intel, on ARM, CPU. On my Raspberry Pi. On your Raspberry Pi at your house, uh, Bluefield adapters, um, all of these are on the cards, absolutely. And we don't need much from the hardware. We need a CPU, could be one of many. We need some memory, we need some flash, we need a network. And when you install the system, you'll find it tries to uh, auto-configure itself. It tries to discover the resources and then build itself. It gives you an option to change, it, change its mind, but he'll just try to do the right thing. Say, I found this stuff, shall I use it? And you go, yeah, go for it. And it'll build a cluster across multiple nodes. And you can see here, we got an example. It's six nodes because we're rager coding, we're protecting the data across a cluster. And you can deploy this system in software in literally minutes. So we've spent an awful lot of time, we don't talk about much here, but it's super simple to deploy, to create tenants, uh, to upgrade, everything online, everything elastic, everything very easy. And in fact, the storage software itself is containerized to make all this stuff fast and super easy. Tell us about the containerization. Yeah, essentially you run one command on a node, uh, it's called Red Setup, and uh, it just instantiates a bunch of containers, they will all get downloaded from a secure registry, and it's all really, uh, you know, microservices. If you run this command on multiple nodes, they find each other on the network, there's really nothing you need to do, you just run one command, and then you can go to any of the nodes immediately to the UI, you click for buttons if you like, everything that it founds, discovered, and think it should use for communicating, it figures out network connections, it figures out what media doesn't have any data on it, and then the system is basically up and running, and so, you know, the whole upgrade process and everything, we, we basically coordinate, you don't have to deal with any of that complexity under the cover, we just coordinate in which order we need to restart containers, what the dependencies are, how they get upgraded, and that's also how we can implement the um, uh, online upgrade, because we just basically restart services that have enough redundancies, and so the system will just figure it out under the cover. Start six nodes like you see here, or it could be six VMs in the cloud, or it could be anything else in principle, and expand to, on day one, 32 nodes is the max. Um, so that's uh, basically starting at a few hundred terabytes, going up to uh, multiple tens of petabytes on day one. We'll expand from there. The nodes, the hardware doesn't really matter. We've picked a piece of hardware on day one to keep our lives simple. So I said, we run on pretty much anything. We'll open it up over time to add in new reference architectures using different hardware, to keep our life sane on day one, we choose a standard AMD-based server. It's great on uh, price performance, it's great on price capacity, it's a great choice to get to market with. So we'll go to market with this, we'll open things up to different environments as we get through 2024. And as I said, we can't help but be fast, and we will be the fastest object store as we launch. 
We start as an object store and also support NVMe over fabrics. And then 20, 20, 2024, we add in more file system uh, services, as in real file services, and also SQL query functions. But here, what you're looking at these graphs, if you go out there and compare them to the best of the best benchmarks out there, we're between two and 10x faster than anybody else out there. So we're very low latency object store, very high throughput, very high number of IOPS. And if you think about it, especially with AWS, we're like 200 times faster. And that's really been stopping S3 from moving into tier one. It's, it's not really the principle. The protocol is the fact that you need that low latency to first byte. Um, many applications really rely upon low latency to first byte. And you see this graph here. This is just the start. You'll see these numbers getting lower as time goes on, as we optimize and optimize. Being C for these small operations, we're getting some millisecond latency. Now, if you, if you knew about this, if you really studied this from S3s, you'll find that nobody else does that. Nobody else does sub microsecond, sub millisecond um, uh, time to first byte. Yeah, and so this will really enable a lot of uh, interactive applications that you simply cannot run with S3 today because customers were forced to use block or use file system solutions for that because that interactivity between requests is, is just the, risk, the quest otherwise up to high. And so with Infinia, we're really gonna launch the first object store that is gonna give that super low latency capabilities and that will allow us uh, to enable much, much more applications that were simply you know, excluded from that because of that fundamental fact. So how are we gonna go to market with this? I mean, obviously, as we said, Anybody who runs an S3 object store and thinks, A, I really want to speed this up. B, I really wish I could have a proper multi-tenancy, dynamic multi-tenancy environment. And, and C, I just want a simpler environment, which is much easier to use. Maybe they're running Ceph today and they want it to be simpler and faster and easier, performing S3 and NVO fabrics. So all of those customers are in play for us. But when it comes to AI, which is obviously this very exciting, growing uh, area in the world right now, as we've heard from all the presentations today, we're already in this inner ring, as we call it, as NVIDIA calls it. The inner ring is the super fast, super performant, parallel file system to make super pods extremely efficient. All that stuff we've been talking about, what Mark talked about, what William talked about before. We already do that stuff at the larger scales in the most super pods in the world, and that's Exascalar. It's our parallel file system. That's the inner ring. But all these organizations have an outer ring. It's about the other things. It's about managing the data, distributing the data, protecting the data, adding metadata to the data, uh, sharing the data, all these other ancillary services, which was absolutely core to the de ongoing development of large AI models for organizations across the world today. And Infinia is the ideal steel shape for this outer ring today, even as an S3 object store supporting Kubernetes with all the features we talked about. Uh, we are targeting these outer ring use cases for AI. And here's just one sneak preview. Um, you can get more detail from us in NDA briefings, but we launch and we start shipping in Q1 in the form you've seen. Everything you've seen with full S3 object services, NVMe over fabric block services for Kubernetes and Cinder, an SQL query engine that allows you to very, very fast uh, look, search, tag that metadata associated with your S3 objects. Then in 2024, so if you install this in Q1, by the end of 2024, you'll find through online upgrades, magically, you have a file system, advanced data management, and much more advanced database-like functions, allowing you to move data between clusters and instances globally, uh, and do that automatically, as well as access those same objects through a parallel file system. So I won't go through all this slide, but huge amounts of benefits. We're really excited. Uh, we think it's just the right time. Despite the long development process, we think we've done everything right. And I think that'll prove us out in the long term over the next couple of years, um, because we're purely software defined, we're fast, quality of service done right, and we've got this data management and database-like features, which I think are just spot on for the moment in this AI model development process. Yeah, and particularly if you have projects in mind where you think, you know, metadata scalability or capabilities of storing massive amount of metadata is holding you back. These are kind of use cases we would like to learn and talk to you about. Uh, we're already talking with lots of autonomous car companies and other non-car, you know, autonomous driving companies 
Um, and so there seems to be a very interesting fit for that. We hear that from pharmaceutical, many, many other industries. So if you have something where you know you think, I need not just to store billions of files and a few metadata, but I might have only one object, but I might have a billion metadata objects associated with it. This is the kind of stuff that we're interested in because that's really what the product is built for, to break that limit of metadata capabilities and also provide very, very low latency access to data.